can't handle the grief, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe you can absolutely make yourself sick by thinking about it and stressing out about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I was living um, not such a great life, and I, uh, I got really sick. And the stress, my intestines stopped working, is what happened. And I, um, they ripped. Wow. And so I didn't have enough money for insurance, and I was just like laying on a dead, a bed dying. Um, I was losing incredible weight. I lost like 40 pounds in a, a week. Wow. And um, I was having a really bad time. And finally, someone came to me out of the blue and contacted me and said, you know, have you tried dealing with this at an emotional level? And I was so desperate and so in pain that I said, I'll do anything. And we worked through some emotional stuff, and that was it. Um, all of a sudden, the next day, stuff started working again, and it was like a miracle healing. I mean, I should have been dead, dead. You know, nobody lives through sepsis like that. And within a few days, I was better, a lot better. And it wasn't. You got to accentuate the positive. Wow! I feel good. A little bit of feel good goes a long way. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just bad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? If you feel like that's what you want to do. Hello and welcome to another show, Accentuating the Positive with Karen Swain. So great to have you with us again. I have another wonderful, fascinating and delicious and very woolly guest for you today. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. I have not been described that before. <laughs> Dr. Darren. Dr. Darren, Dr. Taryn <laughs> Lupo, who is a YouTube personality and the, you know, just as I start the recording, the uh, garbage trucks want to go outside. So hopefully you can't hear the garbage trucks. No, I don't hear him. <laughs> Good. So Dr. Taryn Lupo, <laughs> who is a chiropractor, a health practitioner, and a YouTube personality. He's been on YouTube, showing his face on YouTube and sharing his wisdom with people for around eight years. And he has a fascinating YouTube channel. And he interviewed me last week or the week before on his show. You don't actually have a name for your show, do you, Taryn? No. I, uh, I've never named it because it kind of came out by accident. I, I, you know, I do a segment on Tuesdays called Tearing It Up. With my name, yeah. you see a little, uh, yeah, 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 you like that play on words? Okay, Tearing It Up. Yeah. Uh, so that's the closest name I have. But as far as like the Thursday night show, the Mandela Effect show, I, I don't have a name for it. Yeah. So, so what we're going to talk about today is um, he's a fascinating fellow, actually. And he had me on his show talking about you know, what I love to talk about, talking about being a deliberate creator and cleaning up our thoughts and how we create and the law of attraction, and all that beautiful stuff. So go over, head over to his channel and have a listen to that. It's about two hours long. He invites people on at the end to talk and ask questions. But I was thinking, you know, you're a fascinating fellow. Well, let's interview you and find out what you, what's been happening in your life. His life had a 360 or 180 turnaround, what, about a year ago, eight months ago when you discovered the... Mandela effect, right? Yeah, can you tell? I don't know if you can see I'm blushing this whole time. <laughs> like, it still makes when people introduce me, I'm all like uh, self conscious about it. It's, it's just making me blush. I can't okay. tell because you, there's too much hair on your face. <laughs> is there too much good? That's why I do it. Well, it's, I live in New Hampshire, which is uh, for you guys that maybe don't know America very well, it's right next to Canada. So I live in the right. mountains. Right. Um, I probably look like a mountain guy. And yeah, I uh, decided, um, wait, there's a lot to say, because I am a chiropractor. Uh, I was in like a serious practice for many years, and I just kind of got burned out on that real uh, insurance healthcare model. I, I don't enjoy that. And I sold my practice, got out, and just started doing all the stuff I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I wrote some books. I uh, started learning how to do documentaries and learn how to film and just did a bunch of artistic stuff that I've kind of wanted to do my whole life. And I, uh, it sounds crazy because everybody's like, you know, why would you go to school that long and then not use it? And mm. because I wanted to do these other things, you know, I, I, I feel like uh, life's too short to just pigeonhole yourself doing the same thing for 50 years. I mean, I know some people really like that, but I, I needed other outlets. 
And I, I do feel like maybe that's something that's been more and more with uh, the last few generations. I don't know anyone that has like started a job and stayed with it their mm-hmm. whole life that's like our age. Uh, they've usually had 10 careers and jumped around a bunch. So same with me. <laughs> you know, I tried everything under the sun. And um, I enjoyed, I had some, some moderate success as an author and, uh, you know, enjoyed some of that. And I started a YouTube channel a long time ago, um, about eight years ago, as kind of like a little news service. I always found myself as a, a news reporter. I always wanted to be a news reporter as, ever since I was a little kid. Mm-hmm. And YouTube gave me that opportunity where I was doing liberty-oriented news in this, the south of uh, the United States. So in other words, any sort of freedom issue where like a government would pass a bill and it would be too oppressive or uh, the governments here in, in the U S is really bad. It's just growing and growing and getting completely out of control. So every little step that happens uh, you know, there's a bunch of guys like me yelling about it, but nobody did anything about it. And my process changed over the years. I stopped protesting and being that guy, you know, yelling with a bullhorn and holding signs and begging politicians to be free Mm-hmm. And, um, no, oh my gosh, if we could only get our guy in, just the right guy, all of a sudden the government will magically fix itself. And uh, then the reality hits when you mature a little that <laughs> the system will never fix itself. Yeah. It's meant to be broken. And uh, so now I, 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 I'm not going to turn your show to politics, but that is part of uh, my evolution. I have to, to talk about it a little. The uh, I just realized that that wasn't a good way to live because you're – opposing a force and your all your focus is on negativity as right. in someone's stealing my freedom and I got to fight back. Right. And I don't want to fight in my life. Um, so I mellowed out and over the years I started changing my focus on my channel to uh, positive things you can do with your life. Like I started learning how to grow a garden and feed myself something empowering instead of, you know, uh, fear mongering. And I started making a lot of documentaries about gardening and, and growing food and farming and small farming and stuff like that. And um, I still did some freedom oriented stories once in a while. I did some travel stories just for fun, just to, you know, so if you go to my channel, it's like a big variety channel. It's just whatever yeah. I felt like doing the last seven or eight years. So what happens is I have this channel. Um, I'm, I'm not really doing much doctoring. I'm just kind of seeing a patient here or there just for, for fun as my friends and stuff, but I'm not, I'm not seeing, like I'm not actually opening a practice and and actively in practice. And I decide, um, well, this gives me a lot of freedom because I can be who I I really am. Like, you know, there's a lot of people that are professional you and real you, and those don't, (laughs) don't go high. Like you can't really be who you are if you work in an office, you know, you can't just show up in a flannel shirt and grow a beard and let your hair grow crazy. It, It doesn't, it, uh, that usually that's not allowed. And I got to a point in my life where I just said, screw it. I'm going to be exactly who I am on and off air. And if I lose a bunch of people, I lose a bunch of people. Did, and what happened did, was, I'm sorry. Did you lose a bunch of people? A little, you know, I got a few people that, because some of my stories are about health stories. So they expect yeah. me to be like a doctor and answer questions. And I was like, uh, you know, here's some general advice. Go see a doctor around you. Cause I, I didn't really want to take on like, Mm-hmm. patients over the net and stuff mm-hmm. um so uh, but i got to the point now where I, i'm still going through that transformation like i i, I kind of had a bad spot in my life I, I turned it around and i've been slowly like you do as when you get two choices i've been choosing to go positive and my life's gotten a lot better but uh but the flip side is i live a life of complete freedom lifestyle mm-hmm. like i just don't do anything i don't want to do at this point Mm-hmm. And sometimes that means that you live like a pauper. <laughs> you know, like sometimes the whole money thing's kind of tough because you're you're exchanging some freedom for money in a sense. Um, but I'm a lot happier now because you know when I used to work for the dollar, it, it even though I made a lot of money, um, I never had time to spend it or enjoy it or do anything except work. And now I have tons of free time, but you know, that then you don't have the money. So. It's one of those things that I just figured life's too short. I'm going to do what I want to do, and my channel revolves around that. And I am a full-time YouTuber. Um, that's pretty much my main source of income, and that's what I do. And A full-time the, YouTuber. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, 
That's so fascinating. There's so much I want to say to all that. You know, it's so interesting that you said I've traded money for freedom and yet most people think that having money gives them freedom. So isn't Mm. that interesting? Uh, That's a sort of... That's true, I guess. I mean, Mm. I guess I still have a lot of the old world programming of, uh, you know, money equals freedom. Um, That it's really nice to just have enough that you don't have to actually really worry about it. And I guess that's what I mean is uh, I'd like to get to a point where money's not an issue in my life ever. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to go into a teaching, but... Um, teach me. Teach me. <laughs> preach <laughs> preach more, to me because I'm always listening. More, more garbage trucks. The thing is that you don't, you know, getting to a point where, you know, having money and having freedom is just a vibrational stance. It's not anything you do. It's everything that you feel. It's, you know, it's your beliefs inside you. I have a friend who has plenty of money, like more money than you could ever want. And she's not free in any way, shape or form, in any way, shape or form because of the thoughts in her head, you know. And so mm. money equal free, equal, equaling, equating to freedom is just an idea that we think that we're chasing, you know what I mean? Like we're chasing it. If I get enough money, if I get enough money, I can do what I like, I can be free. But it's, uh, you've got to chase that freedom inside yourself. And, and uh, yeah, anyway. And that is a lesson I'm learning, you know, it's mm-hmm. not something that you have to reprogram yourself, you know, yeah. and um, mm-hmm. it's all part of the process because I'm still in the middle phases of those processes of trying to get that old crud out of my head and program it with new stuff. And I'm sure some of your listeners are struggling with the same thing where they're like, mm-hmm. yeah, I would love to not worry about money, but Hey, I got bills to pay, you know, mm-hmm. tomorrow and uh, I got a truck payment and it's, it's that attitude that keeps you stuck there. But you know, I, I, I'm always open to advice of, you know, how do you get from point A to B? How do I, how do I let go of all that junk and yeah. just not worry about it? Well, so many of us think that we have to change our circumstances in order to do that. I have to quit my job because I feel like I'm in jail in my job or I've got to quit my relationship or I've got to quit my family. You know, I've got to change my outside circumstances, but it's, we've got to change the inside circumstances and just be free wherever I am. Be free inside the job. Be free with the, you know, the family that thinks you're crazy or be free inside your relationship. Like be free. But anyway, I'm not going to go into teaching because this is not about teaching. This is about. Hey, I still like to listen because that's part of who I am at this point. I, uh, if you're going to find out real quick, if you come to my channel, I am the, like the, um, the slowest guy there. That there are people that have been way, way more deep and understand this stuff way better than me that have been, you know, on this path for 20 years of spiritual enlightenment and I'm late to the party, you know, I'm like, Hey, you teach me, teach me. But some people like that vibe because I'm very open-minded. I listen. I don't try to tell you what to do. And uh, I just have people on that are a lot smarter than me on these things. <laughs> and so that's how I listen. I'm like, okay, I'm listening. Look, that's um, the, but that's the way to be. Look, we're all eternal students. I don't care how enlightened you are, what sort of guru you are, what sort of motivational, inspirational teacher, speaker, what sort of amazing healer you are. We're all eternal students. We're here in this physical dimension and we're all, all of us are learning, you know. And, and I love that, you know, I love your curious mind. I love that you're a, you know, a teacher and a student because that's how I see myself. I'm a, I'm a student of the work and I'm a teacher of the work. But um, let me yeah, there's back. some, I'm yeah. sorry, I just want to eject. There's like, you know, some people like me that are new and stumble into it that have mm-hmm. some amazing insights and drop some knowledge if you're listening. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm always blown away, you know, that you just kind of throw that ego out the door and, and, and yeah. you know, listen. Throw that ego out the door, <laughs> yeah. But listen, let me ask you about your journey because I love, I love talking about people's awakening journey. So... I know the Mandela effect when you really looked into it, that, that rocked your world. But before that, so you wanted to put, you said that you wanted to put inspirational and health advice out on YouTube. I love that. And, um, but what was really your spiritually awakening journey where you started to look at the world differently? Uh, Well, I, I come from a family that's not spiritual. And mm -hmm. so I, although I had visions and some psychic vibes. Um, I never really felt like, a, you know, I kind of kept it to myself. I didn't really feel comfortable enough. And I, I think this is some sort of... Elaborate, please. Uh, that, uh, I think this is some sort of man thing. Like when you're, um, 
you know, I was like a rugby player, uh, you know, and then I, I, not too many guys are going to be like, oh, you know, hey, you're going to believe this psychic guy that was doing keg stands at the party. You know, I was not, <laughs> I was not exactly an example of an enlightened being. So I just kind of kept it to myself, but I, I always had some sort of sense. And then when I got into chiropractic, um, I was blessed in a way because uh, healing came to me very easily mm-hmm. and I was, and I was, um, really good at it and the i'm not trying to say that to be arrogant because uh there's lots of things i'm not good at but i was really good at this and i don't know why i i felt like there was a lot of spiritual help like mm-hmm. you know you would i would try to concept to focus on playing with energy and pushing it in and people want to adjust them and stuff like that and i got a lot of results that other people just couldn't get mm-hmm. and i always felt that maybe there was some some higher help on that. So I, that was my kind of introduction to spirituality. Yeah. Um, but what happened over the years is um, you, you know, I kind of just did what I wanted to do. And uh, some people go through like a midlife crisis. I guess I went through mine and I had did some stupid stuff and bad stuff that I'm not proud of and just kind of learned my lesson through life the hard way. And I, I had to kind of hit rock bottom uh, about five years ago, four or five years ago, I hit rock bottom and uh, I had a, a near-death experience, basically. And that, right after that happened, I felt like um, I was given a second chance and I better get my act together. And I tried to atone and do good things after that. And I've been on that path for four years. And then the Mandela effect happened about a year, well, eight months ago. And um, it... All that did for me was it was like gave me a smoking gun in the room of saying, here's some evidence that this reality is not real, that Uh either it can be hacked or screwed with, or this is just a video game here you're playing and you're, you know, real use over there somewhere that the, uh, I don't exactly know what the Mandela effect is, but I do know for a fact that it it is, um, I want to back up to, okay. I want to back up a bit before we get into the Mandela effect. You sort of glossed oh, no. over. I had, you know, you know, I did some bad things, had a near death experience. I want like, w- what was going on with the near death experience? Did you actually physically leave your body, die? Like, what, what was, that, was it? What's well, you mean, it's like, a little embarrassing, but <laughs> I basically, <laughs> come, um, on, come on, we're all friends here. I, I, I had a huge amount of stress in my life, and you know what's funny when because patients will tell you, you know, that stress will make them sick. Mm-hmm. And I kind of understand that, but I never went through it myself. And, you know, you see, especially like if somebody dies, you know, their spouse dies, how sick and they, they die six weeks later because they can't handle the grief, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I do believe you can absolutely make yourself sick by thinking about it and stressing out about it. Mm-hmm. Well, I was living um, n- not such a great life and I, uh, I got really sick and the stress, my intestines stopped working is what happened. And I, um, they ripped. Wow. And so I didn't have enough money for insurance and I was just like laying on a dead, a bed dying. Um, I was losing incredible weight. I lost like 40 pounds in a, a week. Wow. And, um, I was having a really bad time. And finally someone came to me out of the blue and contacted me and said, you know, have you tried dealing with this at an emotional level? And I was so desperate and so in pain that I said, I'll do anything. And we worked through some emotional stuff and that was it. Um, all of a sudden the next day stuff started working again and it was like a miracle healing. I mean, I should have been dead, dead, you know, nobody lives through sepsis like that. And within a few days I was better, a lot better. And it wasn't until I addressed it emotionally that I was like, I did all these bad things. I got to forgive myself, move on, and let's let's fix this. And that is what did it. And it sounds, I know it sounds like new age, healy sort of stuff, but it's the truth. It's what happened. Oh, you know, as a healer, that is exactly what I do with people. It's so interesting that you say that. So the near-death experience wasn't a, like going to the light sort of thing. It was just, No, but I, it was rolling in bed for seven days dying. Kind yeah, of okay. So, all right. So I just wanted to clear that up. <laughs> but the, the emotional thing, you know, I started out like you as a healer. So I started as a naturopath, five years full-time, five days a week, nine to five study, right? Five years of oh, yeah. life, left that and thought, I 
not found anything I think is going to rock the world, you know, and, and opened a furniture, I had a baby and opened a furniture shop. So I spent five years of my life studying and, and didn't do anything with it uh, except for massage. But um, I was exploring healing for years, you know, what's going to make a difference in people's lives. And it wasn't until I realized that it, it is that shift in our perspective and our, in our emotions that really makes, really makes the difference. I've had, and I stopped putting my hands on people and doing healings and started just talking to them because I found that so much more powerful than like channeling energy into their body. I remember I was working on an old lady who was on a lot of drugs and I felt like I had my hands on bricks. Like I had this vision of bricks and I said to my guides, like, why is this energy not getting through to her? And they said, well, one, she's not really a believer. She's sort of like, I, I was massaging her. So, and two, she's on a whole lot of drugs. And I thought, doesn't matter how much energy I evoke and channel into her, it's not, it's not affecting her. And so I started to think, I've got to, you know, change the way I look at this healing thing and started to talk to people. And the most amazing, I had a client once who sat on the couch and after having a conversation with him about a whole lot of things, he said, I actually feel like I'm levitating he wasn't levitating. He said, I can't feel my body. I feel completely free. I can't feel the pain in my body anymore. I feel completely liberated, like I'm floating. And he was just describing what he was going through. And I remember looking at him thinking, wow, that's the best result I've ever had with a client. That, that I've, yeah. you know, and it was because I was talking to him and not because I was healing him or massaging him or doing any sort of you know, healing on him. I was just talking to him and clearing up his emotions. And so I love that story. It really il illustrates how when we shift our emotional baggage, when we shift our perspective, when we change our beliefs, how it's so healing. So cool. Yeah, I'm really interested in that because that's, uh, I, I, that'd be cool to have uh, someone have that kind of relief that they can leave their yeah. body and not feel the pain. And mm -hmm. that would have been great. Um, I, I mean, I have had an outer body experience when I was really young. Mm -hmm. but not as an adult and uh, mm -hmm. except for like dream world, you know, I can, mm -hmm. when I'm, when I'm falling asleep, I can drift off and run around and do what I want, but not, I wouldn't say it's like full blown astral projection or something. Mm -hmm. It's uh, I don't know how to explain it. I'm not, I'm not that great of a, <laughs> you know, like I said, I'm still learning this stuff. It's kind of all new to me. And uh, I stumbled into this. Well, yeah. Well, you're, you're actually a lot better than you think you are. Okay. So you stumbled into it and um, you had an emotional healing, which, which had a, a physical effect, which was great. So the person that was with you was giving you this like emotional healing. The person that... Oh, uh, oh yeah. The advice. Yeah. Yeah. Advice. And then you stumbled into the Mandela effect. So how did you find you're on your, you're on your YouTube, you're happily doing health videos and talking about life and plants and animals and having a lovely right. time. How did you stumble into the Mandela effect? Dumb luck. Really? Um, <laughs> there was two things that happened. Uh, every Halloween, like ever since I was a little kid, I watched, uh, the Charlie Brown Halloween and in America, they showed it like every Halloween and, you know, before days of VCRs and before days of, uh, you know, DVDs or whatever, when you could just watch it, whenever you want, it was always a big deal when I was a little kid, you'd, you'd wait for Charlie Brown Halloween special and, you know, you'd bug the parents about getting the TV that hour. And so I've always watched it and it's one of those things I catch every few years and I'm like, ah, I'm going to watch it for fun. And last year we watched it and I'm watching it with my girlfriend and the ending's different. And I'm thinking, okay, what happened? You know, at the end when the pumpkin comes up, where's the pumpkin? The great pumpkin comes out the very end and uh, Linus isn't there. Like he's been waiting, waiting, waiting all night and he walks away and the pumpkin rises up. And, um, and it, it changed because I was like, we went and looked on Google and we're like, maybe there's two versions. Maybe they thought it was, you know, it's 1960s. Maybe it was a little too anti-Christian or occult. So maybe they made two versions. Mm -hmm. um, no two versions just wasn't there. And so it really bothered us. I was like, man, I really remember this. It was my favorite part. Of, you know, I've been watching this since I was a little kid. It's my favorite part is, you know, when the funky comes out. And then, um, like I was looking it up and I can't remember what I was searching for something. And I, YouTube, channel pulled up about the Mandela effect and I watched one and I was like, Oh man, I remember that too. And then it just led down that path. And after a few 
days it screwed me up so bad. I was, um, I had to make a story about it. And so I made a story telling everybody, Hey man, this thing's like taking over my life. It's all me and my girlfriend talk about now. And I made a story and it got really well received and people were like, make another story, make another story. And then my channel ended up making like 50 Mandela stories. Um, and stop making farming videos because I was getting so much traffic and um, I decided to start a live show. So I did a live show about it and that took off. And then, um, and then I got to the point where I was like, okay, enough Mandela stuff. I need to have another show where I can talk about what I want. <laughs> and so, uh, so there's two worlds. I, I still kind of, I'm like a hub for Mandela community, but I also just have a rotating channel of whatever I want to do. So I'm trying to find so, balance. Yeah. So you're exploring more spiritual principles like you've had me on and you've oh. had psychics on. What else do you explore on the show? Um, you know, we've had, uh, here's the way I, I wanted to do it is mm -hmm. I wanted to have a safe place where people could talk about stuff that you would be called crazy for any other place mm -hmm. and, um, and actually discuss it and not have a bunch of arguing and debating, just like discuss it. Mm -hmm. So there's a very polite vibe on my channel. I don't put up with, uh, it's not like a debate show. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so people come on and I've had everything from let's talk about D wave computers and quantum physics to let's shift our reality to, okay, here's how to develop psychic powers to, mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk about crystals today. You know, whatever people want, as long as it's that vibe is, uh, I, I pretty much only have one rule that it, it, it needs to be positive and uplifting to somebody's life. Yeah, cool. Like I really feel like at this point in my life, I'm trying to keep finding positive and uplifting things until I I ascend. I mean, Tend to you ascend. that's where I'm oh, trying got, to go. Oh, I've got lots of stories to tell you about that, but says my internet connections were unstable, but uh, I think you froze for a minute. Oh, sorry. Um, just for people who don't, just for people who don't know what the Mandela effect is, could you explain it to them, please? Sure. Um, the name is because of Nelson Mandela. So what happened was there was a psychic named uh, Fiona, Oh, I forgot her last name, maybe Fiona Brown, that she was talking with some people and said, hey, don't you remember Nelson Mandela dying back in the 90s? And then a bunch of people were like, yeah, I remember that too. And I definitely remember it because I remember we were, I was like, it was like at the end of high school, somewhere in the high school and they, we talked about it in civics class one day. We were like, oh yeah, he died and this is who he is and this and that. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of years later, I'm watching a rugby match in uh, South Africa versus uh, New Zealand. And all of a sudden they march him out in a South African jersey, a box jersey. Yeah. And I'm like, I thought he was dead. And everybody's like, no, he's not dead. And I was like, no, he's dead, man, right? And I figured that my memory was just bad that I mixed yeah. him up with some other leader. And yeah. uh, I was like, okay, I guess he's not dead. And then I just kind of put it away. And then I started hearing talking about it online. And I was like, yes. He was dead. <laughs> and so a lot of people remember Mandela dying. So the thing got the slang of Mandela effect. But the idea has been around for a long time. It, it didn't just happen. But what happened around 2016 is there was a massive awakening that people started noticing that the realities have shifted and started just blowing it up all over the Internet. And the way people search for it is called the Mandela effect. But it's really all about shifting realities and um different people have different opinions of what it is. Mm -hmm. Lots of different ideas out there. And there's a lot of people that say they know the truth or what it is. And, mm -hmm. you know, but there's 10 people saying that, so they all can't be right. Um, I'm just having a bit of a chat to my mob, my guides. And they're telling me that things really shifted in 2012. We all talked about the end of the world. And um, they're saying that the energy's really ramped up in 2012. And uh, that, that is one of the theories that there was at, some sort of like mass and, extinction event or something. I don't know about mass extinction, but um, the light packets of energy that are hitting this planet are exponential. So they really ramped things up in 2012 and they're still ramping things up. So it's kind of like the quickening. Let's call it the quickening, um, you know, from that movie. <laughs> the Highlander. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so where, where is it going? What is your mob saying? <laughs> but hang on Let, let's get back to yeah hey. <laughs> okay Don't, you can't, you can't hold the ending <laughs> i've got more questions for you <laughs> okay. um so oh, people, well i'm sorry so the people that were wondering is 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 basically for the new people that don't know what it is it's named after nelson Mandela, but it encompasses all kinds of changes of uh different realities a lot of people feel that we slid to another reality 
but this is not the reality we grew up in. Um, some people feel that there's two worlds merging, breaking apart. Other people feel like we've jumped multiple times. Multiple. Um, and mm-hmm. there's just all different theories. And then some people believe CERN ripped a hole in space time and did it. And uh, okay, so, so I don't know. So, yeah, so, D-Wave so computers so and quantum. Cool. Oh, uh, I forgot. I forgot what CERN stands for. It's it's a hadron collider over in, you know, the giant hadron collider yeah. that they were, That's obviously the government never is truthful about what it is. I'm sh- there's way more going on there than just slamming particles together. And, um, and so they think that they've done something to, to actually rip holes into other realities and information's bleeding through. Uh, mm-hmm. It's kind of like described as, um, you know, the old school radio stations when you used to have like uh, FM or AM and you would slide the dial and you'd pick up two stations at once. Yeah. It's kind of what's going on right now with the realities. That, you know, that's that a, the realities right. so my vibrating. Guides, my guides are confirming that that is a really good analogy because what, what they do with me is trying to teach concepts that our puny little linear human minds can wrap our you know minds around. They give me analogies. I was having a chat to them this morning about that. And... Um, and they were telling me how beautiful analogies are. They're not, they're not the, they don't pinpoint the truth because from our perspective, it's really hard to see the truth because it's so multidimensional. But they give us an idea of how to sort of digest it from our perspective. And they just said that that's a really good analogy that you just said there. Ah, hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> how do you talk to your mom? I want to learn how to talk to my mom. Well, wanna... I've got a webinar happening uh, 24th or 25th of May, depending on what country you're in, um, around this time, which is uh, I'm going to show people how to do that. Exactly. How to chat to your spirit guides. And it's so much easier than what you think because there's – you know, there's no mystery to it. It's so interesting because during my intense search for healing and meaning when I was in my 30s, I, um, you know, I, 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 as I said on your show, I was massaging people and I got a whole lot of information coming through and I had to explore this. So I did masses of healing courses. And what I found out was I learned to do what I'd always been doing. And that's, that's really what I want to teach people. It, it's just so much easier than we think. And um, it's just a matter of focus. But anyway, I'm not going to go into that now. We're going to get oh, back to you. Yeah, you're going to leave me hanging for a month. I'm not going to be able to talk to my guides for a month. <laughs> this is not about me. This is about you. <laughs> you can't drop nuggets of knowledge and expect me not to ask. I <laughs> know. On. Two curious people, right? Talk to each other. This is but, it. <laughs> but you said a lot of people have different ideas about the Mandela effect and this. this. What do you believe? You've been exploring it for like eight months. There's your girlfriend again. Hello. Oh. And, um, <laughs> And uh, what do you think is going on? I lean towards the Dolores Cannon camp, sort of, where it's, um, I feel like the Earth's evolving. I'm watching the showman residents go up constantly. Um, I feel like the planet is alive, and it's simply, like, growing up like we do. It's, it's had enough of this reality, this negative vibe, and it's splitting. So there's going to be a negative you know, planets stuck behind in a, in a more positive, higher vibration planet. And right now you have the choice of, do you do positive things and go with the positive and match that energy and ride this out of here? Or do you stay with this world of that we have now? That's what feels right to me. But, um, and at this point, the reason the Mandela effect is happening is because the worlds are splitting apart and we're, we're seeing uh, two realities at the same time. We're in that mesh. That's what I feel, but I'm a positive Patty and I'm always going to come down and not be a negative Nancy that um, a lot of people um, believe that, you know, this is the end of the world and terrible things and bad things, you know, that CERN basically is going to kill us all. And I don't take that vibe because I don't want to create that reality. I'd, I'd rather ride the other reality out of here. So well, ooh, I'm that's where so I'm much at. Information as you talk and what they're saying to me about this is, you know, there's no right or wrong in this. There's just what you want to experience. So they've given me an analogy. Imagine that you go to the slums of India, right? And you experience that reality, but yet you've experienced like a Western reality, clean streets, order, you know, all that sort of thing. What is it that you choose to experience? There's no right or wrong. There's no better or worse. There's just experience. And so, you know, there will be people that choose 
to explore third dimensionality, second, 3D, first D, there will be souls, let's call them souls, that want to stay there, that want to explore that. They want to, they want to like I said recently, you know, uh, Natalie Sudman is one of the people that I interviewed who was blown up in a bomb blast in 2007. So she had oh, this amazing near-death experience and I was having a couple of chats to her on my show about war and deliberate creation, all this delicious stuff. And I said, do you think that war will ever stop to cease existing on this planet? And she said, yes, the exploration of violence has had its day. I just loved those words, you know. It's like we've been exploring violence and, and dense vibrations. We've been exploring that as a human race, as a, as a collective. You know, there are people that have been hanging out in this dimension and this on this planet for eons of time and exploring all that you know we have to offer and it's and it's now it's just groundhog day now we just keep going around in circles we've done it and and the majority of us that have been here exploring it like a new we want to move on to a new experience like imagine a world without violence and without hatred and without poverty what's possible there? Like there's a whole range of possibility available that we can't even conceive of at the moment. And yet there are others that are like, no, I actually want to keep exploring this. So yeah. So there's, yeah, I I don't feel that everybody's going. And I think that's right. That Mm. there's going to be some people to go to a higher vibration and other people choose to stay here. And I get it. Um, I had a spiritual vision where it kind of related to me as video games. Mm-hmm. that um, me and you decide to go play this, this virtual game together and we're on the outside of the, and before we go in, we say, you know, we're buddies, but do you want to play as friends or do you want to play as enemies? Exactly. And you say, well, you know, we played 20, the last 20 games we've been friends. Let's, let's compete this time. So mm-hmm. you're going to go in as a warlord. I'm going to be an orphan and you're going to kill my parents and we're going to see what that experience is like. And you go in and you do that. And that's, then you come back out and you say, Oh, well, that was pretty awful but let's try this one and let's see what this experience is like i'm going to swap flip flop it and i feel like um you shouldn't get it while you're in it obviously it's horribly emotional and all this stuff but that's part of the experience Mm -hmm. but when it's over it's just like you sitting there with your buddy after a game ends and saying well that was pretty fun you really blew up my uh world there (laughs) so uh all right let's start the game again let's change it around this time and so I don't think these are necessarily evil or bad people. I think they're just playing a bad role this life and uh, for the experience, you, got it. you know. That was so well explained. That's just, you got it. Absolutely. I mean, people hate to think that this life is just a video game. You know, they hate that analogy because it is so real. It's like the holodeck, you know, the holodeck on. But, um, it is. And you're, in order for you to experience it really good, you have to forget you're playing a game. Otherwise, if we know we're playing a game the whole time, it's exactly. not that immersive. Exactly. 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 But at the same time, you know, when you do forget, waking up to remembering is so exhilarating. And when, yeah, you do, and, and when you do wake up to remembering that I'm creating all of it, you know, like I'm creating a video game and I have choice, I have choice, I have choice, I have choice. That's even more exhilarating to think that you're a victim to circumstances and then realize that you've actually created them. And now you can choose, you can deliberately choose like that's exhilarating to forget and then remember. It's so exhilarating. So, you know, to have that experience while you're I like what because we're still in the game, right? I really like what you said, that the exploration of violence, and that's a great way to explain it. They're just exploring what it's like to do this. And uh, yeah, hopefully that, that's run its course. Because I, I know from my own self, I don't really want to, to run that game, you know, um, not where I'm at. So Been there, done I'm, ready it. To and, move, I'm ready to move on. And it limits you, you see, because, because of the exploration of, oh, well, we've been exploring control and separateness and violence and a whole lot of things. It, it, it creates an exciting ride, you know, a lot of fear and terror and ah, but at the same time, you, it, it limits you to what you can experience. So once you sort of get rid of a few of those rules, like let's just get, okay, in the video game, let's take out violence and, you know, and stuff like that. And let's see what we can explore now. Whew, you just like so much more becomes available to you. It's a bit like you said, I be, I, I'm, I'm trying to be happier. I'm trying to turn the negative into the positive. And my life really shifted when I started doing that. Like more possibility became available to you 
once you started being more positive and that's the thing about vibration when you when you raise your vibration from me against you and you're wrong and I'm right and all that stuff that we do the life experience becomes so much more expansive and so much more becomes available and when you're playing inside ego sort of centric it's all about me and you're wrong and I'm right and you know I'm going to fight you on that you kind of box yourself into a little box so that's what we've done as a human race and and now we're expanding and things are getting really interesting <laughs> I'm excited now. I mean, now that, uh, and this is one thing I have to go back to the Mandela effect. Um, Mandela effect was hugely spiritually enlightening for me uh -huh. to not just because, you know, okay, yeah, uh, whatever. Berenstein bears Berenstein. It, it, it's not that junk. It is the fact that it is, a, like I said, a smoking gun that this reality is not real. And if that's the case, I don't have to fear death anymore. I don't have to be worried that, you know, um, that's the end. And I used to be terrified of dying. Wow. Now I don't care. It's like restarting a video game. It's like, okay, <laughs> you know, if I want to come back in, I can, if I don't, I'm going to split somewhere else. And, um, it's been hugely uplifting for me and uh -huh. I'm trying to live a better life and do more positive things and, and, and be, um, help a community rise above and, 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 uh, do, do better things too. I, you know, I, I want others to, to uh, to be here for them when they wake up and go through this too. Um, right. I, I don't know. That's what I feel like I'm supposed to be doing here. But yeah. sometimes you get bogged down in the minutia and there's a lot of days where I'm like, man, I am so drained and just dramaville and I'm over it and I just need a, you know, I need a break or should I keep doing this? So it's, it, I, I want to know how you constantly, you seem to always be positive. Like how do you stay I want to be that person, but sometimes I still get dragged into the, the BS. Such a good question. You know, I have, um, I have my mom. I'm just looking because we invited a couple of people. I'm just checking who's answering. Yeah, go ahead if you need a minute. I have my mob constantly talking to me and I have these amazing conversations as I'm making a cup of tea or putting my makeup on or, or sitting on the loo you know like <laughs> I, I have questions all the time I'm sort of like I'm thinking about you this morning and I'm thinking about the conversation nah. had before. and I've and I, uh, I have this constant dialogue in my head with them which is really fascinating and um, I was having this conversation with them well I think last night actually about I don't stay positive all the time. Like I will, um, I've got a bit of pain in my body because I'm not active enough. And I keep saying, what's the pain in my body? And they say, get off the bloody couch and go and do some exercise. And I'm like, oh, okay. And, um, uh, and I get a bit sort of depressed about that. But it doesn't take much to sort of snap me out of that. For something funny on, on television, someone sends me, you know, I look at something on YouTube, someone sends me a message, an email, and I'm completely snapped out of it. So it's not my, it's not my emotional set point, right? So I have an emotional set point which I have worked to raise. And things, exactly what you've talked about, things like understanding who I am and what I'm doing here and how this is not you know, this is not me, like my mind is not me, my body is not me, this life is not me, I'm beyond that, I'm pure positive energy, I'm connected, I'm a soul exploring the universe. You know, concepts like that have really rocked my world and shifted my perception. And when I tune into that reality, it just completely raised my vibration and made me a lot happier person because I felt connected to the true me and not the thoughts that run in my head, like I'm not good enough or, you know, I'm tired or I'm in pain or I'm hungry or all those thoughts that we have on a constant basis, right? And when you raise that emotional set point, you kind of live in this happy place, which is your connection to your soul, your connection to your source. But it doesn't mean that you're happy all the time. You still get frustrated and angry and, and you still have pain, like you still experience a human experience but you can snap out of it really quickly. Whereas some people have an emotional set point, which is low. So they might be happy or, or depressed, but when they come back to that default setting, they're sort of in this, uh, everything's you're like, uh, you know, what's the Got point? Uh, uh, you know what I mean? So <laughs> you have That's to... Good <laughs> That's a good imitation. Do that again. I know a lot of those people. Yeah, it Look, just like I it. had a friend yesterday. I was at chanting. I get a chanting most weeks, right? And uh, he was in my face. 
I've got so many people in my face all the time asking me to help them fix them, heal them. And I do oh, a lot. Yeah. I do a lot of that all the time. And I've just got to put boundaries up. And he's like, fix me, fix me. Why aren't I happy? What's wrong with me? I've had a cold for 10 years and I can't get rid of it. And I'm just looking at it and I've got no money, so I can't come and pay you. Right, of course. <laughs> and, and I'm just looking at him and I'm just getting so much information about him. And so what do I tell him? What do I say to him? I said to him, I can't fix you. It's your journey. You have to do that for yourself. But you call yourself a healer. Why can't you fix me? And I said, but I don't call myself a healer anymore. I'm a teacher. I'm going to teach you how to fix yourself. And he's like, I want you to fix me right now. You know, why am I depressed all the time? And, you know, driving home, I got all this information about what he needed. So what do I do? Do I reach out and give it to him? Do I book him in for a session? You know, if this is my constant dilemma, people are always at me like, fix me, fix me, heal me, but I can't mm. pay you. <laughs> So, I, you you do attract that. that. Well, I, I honestly think that sometimes um, like a source will just show up, like something, someone will drop a lot of money on you so you don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. Or, you know, I feel like that that's going to happen in my own life that I'm going to, I feel very, very lucky. I want to win go. something. There you go. And, um, and if that happens, then yeah, I could just do good stuff and not worry about money. But I, I do believe that part of the healing process is also the exchange though. I don't think, my worst patients are the ones you give stuff to, for free for. They don't Absolutely. appreciate it. This is so important. Absolutely. When you give people free advice, they do not take it off. When people come no. and sit and pay me, they take on every single thing that happens because sometimes I'm talking, sometimes we're meditating, sometimes I'm reading. There's all sorts of things that happen. And they take it away with them and they do it and they use it and they appreciate it. Because they've, and especially if it's a lot of money, like I charge $250 for a personal session, which is actually not a lot of money. I know psychics that charge like five, six, eight hundred $800 for an hour's session. So I'm thinking, I'm, not, I'm cheap compared to them. And they really, the more you pay, the more you value it and the more you do. And it's such an interesting experience, this, you know, exchange of um, something that you think you value, like money. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Oh, it's important. I think um, I did a lot of functional medicine, which is uh, I still do, it's, it's, which is uh, blood work. You basically mm -hmm. get blood work. Uh, you look for very subtle patterns that most doctors don't look for. And then you develop a nutrition and lifestyle plan based on their particular blood work. And the people that used to come in our clinic would drop five to $10,000, you know, in one shot. And you talk about someone that drops five to 10 grand, they're serious. They do what you tell them to do and they're in it. Uh, exactly. They got a lot of skin in the game. And uh, exactly. then the patients that would roll in and just be like, well, I got a hundred bucks. Tell me something. And it's like, you never saw those people again. You never, uh, it wasn't serious to them, but it used to bother me because they would pull up in a $20,000 truck. You know, they'd have a new iPhone seven and, they had everything they wanted, but the health wasn't important. They, they didn't have money for that, you know, uh, but they had everything else they wanted. So it, it has to be their priority. Um, and that's, that's when it's important to them. When you're so miserable, you can't get out of bed because you have auto-inflammatory disease and everything you do in your life sucks uh, because you're sick feeling. All of a sudden, it becomes a priority again. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> then, then people are ready to dole the money out. But until yeah. then, no. It's really interesting, isn't it? I know there's this guy, a uh, spiritual teacher, uh, I can't remember his name, but he said, you know, we spend our lives working to earn the money, to have the freedom, and we get sick because we work so much, and then we spend all the money we earn on getting sick. <laughs> <there. laughs> uh, that's where I'm at. I just like, I'm done. Uh, I, I, I worked just long enough to know I hate the rat race. It's just not, I, I can't do it. It's bad for my soul, and so I stay out of that. <laughs> I do. I'd, I'd rather live in a cardboard box and do what I want than uh, have to work a job I hate. Come back into the light. You sit back and oh. you're out of the light. There Sorry, I was comfortable. Back into the light. Angelic, look, there's a light. <laughs> you're, back, you're back into the light. Okay, so what's happening in the now to future for you? Like, where are you going with all this? That's a good question for you. I don't know. Because <laughs> what happened was my YouTube channel took off. And then the boycott happened. And then I guess I was maybe like the flavor of the month for a while. People were really into my new show. 
you know, I was the only person live streaming really um, on this topic. And then now everybody's doing a live stream and my channel has, you know, not has been as popular last month. It's, it's gone down a good bit and I don't know what's going on because I would love to make a full-time living on YouTube, but it is so erratic. It, it is a fickle, fickle woman, YouTube. It does not, uh, it giveth and it taketh. And I, I wanted to give it more. <laughs> so, like, you know, I'm, I'm doing more stories than ever, more time. I'm getting more views and, you know, I'm making less money. So it's one of those things that I'm not sure what's going to happen because I still want to do it. Even, you know, even if I make no money, I'm still going to do stuff. But I don't know if I can crank out as many stories as I do. You know, I, it, it, there is a time exchange sort of thing. I, you know, if I got to pay the rent, I got I to gotta do some blood work or take something on again. And uh, I try to keep my, my doctor to a minimal uh, if I can avoid it, it's, I enjoy it. I work on certain cases that are fun, but as far as, um, uh, like opening to the public, I don't think I'll ever do that again. You know, I won't, you know, I, won't practice. I, I love, I love chiropractic. You know, as a, the chiropractic is one thing I didn't study, but I, when I was in my early twenties, I was going to osteopaths and chiropractors. And, and then I worked as a massage therapist because we are in these physical bodies and I, I remember I, brought, I used to drive a motor scooter and when I was young and young and hip. And um, I had an accident. <laughs> yeah. I had an accident. A car came down a one-way street and smashed me up pretty bad. And I remember this young guy with the operation on me said, I wanted to be a carpenter, but I thought more interesting. He was Asian. I thought more interesting, put the body back together again, like, like putting, building a bookshelf. And I remember thinking about his analogy and I thought, yeah, more interesting than building bookshelves. And the, and the chiropractic's a bit like that, you know, you sort of go out, break yourself up and then the chiropractors like put you back together again. I, I like chiropractic, but I wouldn't, you know, it's kind of feel like I did it. Um, I just put enormous amount of time trying to get my diplomate in clinical nutrition. It's like another four years of endocrinology and, uh, mm. and, and med. And I, I, there's only so many people that do it. So it's one of those things that I put a lot of time into that realm that I don't think I would actually go back out to adjust people unless I absolutely had to. It just doesn't interest me as much as, um, I like doing blood work and, and figuring out what's wrong with chronic people besides just like adjusting. Um, not that that's not important, but it's just not my vibe. I, I, I'd rather send that out to a chiropractor that's on their game and doing it. Mm, mm, um, mm. That's it. It's, you go through things, Karen, you know, uh, Karen, why are you not, you know, a naturopath? Cause that's just not your vibe anymore. You know, you take the knowledge out of it. And so I don't really adjust, uh, but I'm, I'm very pretty darn good with uh, figuring out why people are chronically sick. So I, I think it's more important to do that for me. It's, in, it's interesting what you said uh, when you talked about being, um, you know, natural healer. That was so my path as well. When I was a young girl thinking, what do I want to do? There's so many things to explore. And somebody said, you know, go and do this naturopathic um, or, or go and do this massage course, which was did not interest me at all. And once I started... <laughs> Once I started on that healing road, things seemed to miraculously open up for me. Like these experiences just kept happening. And I thought, wow. So that's your, that's your soul talking to you about your life plan. Well, yeah. I mean, talk to your mom. Ask them what my next move is because I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure where I'm going. At this point, I've gotten crazy enough that I just completely trust the universe to uh, just take me where it wants me to go. I don't, I don't know, man. And it'd be nice if I had a little more of a roadmap, but. I feel like I'm constantly just drifting around doing what the universe tells me to do. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Oh, you need to come and have a reading with me, honey. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to uh, pause this for a moment. Cool. Okay. And, and we're back and we've got a few people that have joined us or a couple of people, Kristen and Uni, Uni Rock. And uh, I, I invited a couple of people to join us to, um, well, Uni's already met uh, Doc, Doc. Dr. Taryn and uh, Kristen is here to ask a few questions to the doc. We've actually, when I've been um, in getting these people online, I had the recording off. We've been talking about doing chiropractic uh, adjustments psychically, you know, across the internet, across the other side. Oh. We've been talking about medical intuition and all sorts of things. So Kristen said, you've got a, you've got a question for the doc, a chiropractic question. Does, do you want that? Is that okay? 
<laughs> you can. I don't know if I'll help you much, but I'll, I'll give it a whirl. What, what do you want to know? Never been to a chiropractor. Um, having uh, tinnitus issues, and I've been told that there might be a connection. I just went and had uh, sat in a little booth in an audiologist's office for a long time, and he told me that my hearing loss and tinnitus is kind of in my head. So Okay. Funny you should mention this because I have actually made a story just about this topic. Um, lately with the Schumann resonance, which is like the Earth's heartbeat, it's, it's mm -hmm. been speeding up tremendously and people are all complaining about ringing in their ears. As a chiropractor, I used to deal with this problem a lot. So I know all about tinnitus. And the uh, as a chiropractor, what they usually look at and check is your eustachian tube. That is the tube that runs from your ear to your throat, and it lets you drain. And what it does is it pressurizes your ear. So if that thing gets pinched mm -hmm. or compressed, you don't have proper pressure in your ear anymore, and it can't drain. So it's much like um, when children have chronic ear infections, and they are constantly going to get you know uh, to the ear doctor, and eventually they just stick tubes in their ears. The reason, a big reason that um, they never get better is because their eustachian tubes compressed. And what happens is the eustachian tubes runs right across the atlas bone, right near it. Mm -hmm. And uh, when your top of your neck gets out of whack, it will compress that tube. So it's kind of like having a toilet that won't flush. Sure, you can keep cleaning the toilet, but eventually it's going to get overrun. Um, your ear... Sure, you can keep throwing antibiotics at it, but eventually it's just going to get overrun. If you don't fix the tube, it can't flush. Um, and so chiropractors, the way they usually deal with that is they adjust the, the top bone, the atlas, which takes the compression off the tube, balances okay. the, ba the stops the ringing because of the pressure difference, and uh, it ends up being like a, a subluxation mechanical problem. Also, uh, just restoring the nerve flow, that area helps a lot too. So just taking, you know, the nerve can get pinched too. So uh, there's there's multiple reasons. Hopefully that helps you understand that. If if you haven't, if you have ringing in the ears or your kid has chronic ear infections and you haven't gone to a chiropractor, you're doing yourself injustice because you will go down a bad, a very expensive road full of tubes and antibiotics. Now it doesn't always happen. Not everything's a chiropractic, you know. Right. There's patients that I can't, but the majority of the ones I saw never had to go any further. You know, um, you, you, you fix that so everything drains right and you're happy. So that being said, I would swing to a chiropractor to see if the tinnitus stops. You've been already checked out by the audio guy, so, you know, you know it's not something more serious. Um, if the chiropractor can't deal with it, then there's a good chance that you might be being affected just by the resonance that's going on right now. Cause the big download, people, right? <laughs> the download, I guess, or you see the frequency is changing. So right. the human ear can start picking stuff up at 20 hertz. Um, and sometimes the earth's over like 39 hertz. So some people with amazing hearing can start hearing noises like a low bomb in their ear. Or they're like, oh, man, I, I keep hearing a buzz. Um, they're hearing the earth that's raising in and out. And uh, as this gets higher and higher, which I think it's going to get a lot higher, uh, I think people are going to actually start hearing it. That's a, well, that's they basically, oh, they basically told me um, at the specialist that, because I always had excellent hearing. My husband said I had bionic hearing. I'd walk in the house and I'd be like, who left the stereo on? And there's no music coming out. I can just hear it on. So when I went to this audiologist, he said, probably you just had superhuman hearing. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe with age, it's gone down some. Um, you know, they didn't what, what, mention going to the chiropractor. I just have had no, friends mention they, it. So it's I not, just, it's no, they're not going to bring it up. They're not going to tell you. No. Yeah. So it's just my next step. I just, it was funny. I didn't know you were a chiropractor. So I thought I'd bring it up. I, I only play one on TV. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know what I'm. Is that, is that is that joke too dated or what? No, no. I still say that. That's okay. <laughs> what works I want, for me. What I want to do to you is I want to turn you into a psychic chiropractor so that you can work with people over the internet. If I knew how, I mean, again, okay. like to me, if you'd said that to me five years ago, I would have laughed at you. But now, mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, what's real? Why not? Why can't you know? Why can't I move stuff 
from a distance. I have no idea. I've never tried it. Well, let's it do just, it. Let's do it. And I'll be your first patient. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I just did it. And uh, <laughs> oh, oh, wow. <laughs> It's easier than you think. And let me introduce Uni down here. Like, like, where are your worlds? Your worlds have not, like, where have they gone? <laughs> they, oh, they come out and then, you know how there it is. Oh, go. there they are. That is they so come back. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> how are you? <laughs> Thanks for letting me come on. <laughs> I'm good. So he has another YouTube channel. You talk about conspiracy theories. I've had, not had a chance to watch any of your um, shows yet. I have to say I'm not, I don't really t sort of tune into conspiracy theories. That's okay. It's a, it's one of those things you got to have a taste for, for sure. So I think it's a bit like the Mandela effect, you know, when you uh, tune into conspiracy theories and you see how many different ideas there are out there, you start to sort of realize that everyone just gets to have their own point of view and oh, yeah. everyone's reality is their own reality. And we're living in this multidimensional experience and everyone has their own reality. You know, your reality is very different to mine and vice versa. And it makes this seem less uh, fixed and, you know, this, this world less um, solid and it makes it more malleable and fluid and, you know, yeah. So. Definitely. Yeah, when, just like the doc said a few years back, I, I wasn't as open-minded as I am now. And uh, with, with all the things I've come to find by meeting, you know, open-minded, really nice people that you, I start realizing that there's a huge side to life that I should have been looking into much, much longer ago. You know, I could have grown a lot more with it and uh, it really helps me um, in so many ways. Um, you guys were talking about healing. Um, I uh, got injured in um, the military when I was deployed to Iraq and a lot of things didn't work for me and I was constantly in pain. And um, the one thing that helped more than anything else was, and it's a lot of people, you know, criticize me for saying this, but it was acupuncture. Mm -hmm. And it was right when they put the acupuncture needles in the back of my skull. I don't, and they don't go in deep or anything. I know you guys know that, but um, it was just something about releasing something that I don't know how, how to explain it. But, you know, that's what kind of opened me up a little because a lot of doctors were telling me that that wouldn't work and there's no sense to try it. But Actually, the military paid for it and everything. They were really cool about it. Wow, and, uh, really? They paid for, for sure. acupuncture? Yeah, they hired a uh, acupuncturist at Fort Campbell. He has his wow. own office. It's yeah. come a long way, I guess. I remember back in the day, they wouldn't have ever done something like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I'm open to all the different, you know, um, explanations for things. And, my mind, you know, now that my mind's open, I just feel like I can make so much more progress now. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Uh, Uni's smoking a fake cigarette there. We, 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 like, I love that. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to quit. You know, what I remember they... first hearing about acupuncture years ago. Some of the first books I ever read were the Shirley MacLaine books. And uh, she talked about um, acupuncture she had an acupuncture reading in her third eye to open up her third eye and to give her more psychic experiences and she had a, a like a um, I think she left her body or she had a channeling I can't remember it was too many years ago that I read it but I remember reading that acupuncture was the vehicle that she used to sort of have this expanded experience and I thought oh that was cool yeah, so, yeah. Hmm. that coincides with my story a little too because my mind opened after acupuncture so it could have I guess I never thought about it that way but yeah i mean it could have maybe helped me i know it helped me uh see that not every explanation is is uh, has to be scientific or you don't have to listen to everybody to get the right answer so um maybe it maybe it did help because i i did feel a lot more in tune i started meditating you know trying everything else i could find out there so i could see how somebody would go that route for sure mm -hmm. that's cool mm -hmm. So back to you, Doc. This is your uh, this is your hour. You're the star of this show. <laughs> <laughs> That's an unusual thing. Go ahead. It's weird being on this end, but I'm enjoying it. It's actually really nice. I have no responsibility. I don't have to run anything. <laughs> I know. I'm a, I'm a good guest. <laughs> on your show, <laughs> on your show, <clears throat> excuse me. You um, you're monitoring people's comments. You're looking at people's comments when they comment, and it's it's a lot because I do what's called a live chat, and for you guys that don't know this uh, YouTube has a feature where we can have a live show like this with all of us going 
and everybody watching can add comments and ask questions at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it takes a little practice to focus on your guests, listen to what they're saying, and field questions, and uh, and also police the drama at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and and I've, I'm getting better at it, but I, I'm not there yet. Uh, so sometimes it might look like I'm distracted, but I'm listening because mm -hmm. I'm always trying to feed questions in from the audience. And so it's a very interactive experience. Uh, viewers really like it because they'd be like, ask, you know, ask her and what she thinks of her mom or you know, whatever. <laughs> ask her mom a question and, uh, and I can feed it in that way. Mm -hmm. I think that um, it is distracting. You have to really be a, like a multitasker. No, yeah. I think when you were doing, when you were having a chat with me on your show, I think you only asked me one or two questions from the chat room because it was just too much going on. You've got people online, then you've got people chatting, then you're talking to me. It's like, how is he doing this? Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> but it's important because, uh, you know, these people take their time to write these questions and ask them and they yeah. really want to know something. And I, I, I feel like they, I owe it to them to feed it in if I can. And, uh, I, I, what happens is I also have really good moderators that if I miss something, they'll, they'll keep saying it over and over until I see it, you know, and I'll be like, oh, okay. I'll catch uh, an important question. So, but if you guys have never done that, it's a real fun experience uh, doing a live show. Mm -hmm. I do those tomorrow night. I've got one. Yeah. So, well, I've not done it myself. Um, I don't think I could cope with all the multitasking because I like you, to, you got to have like help. To, like, <laughs> I like to really focus on my guests because, you know, I use my intuitive abilities, my, you know, when I'm talking oh. to people, like I'm, because I remember when I was first on radio, I thought, because I was working a panel when I was on radio. So I was tuning into my guides. So I was in my expansive mind as well as my logical mind trying to work out knobs and, and volume and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And then I'm focusing on the questions I'm asking the person on the other side of the desk. And I thought to myself, I am never going to be able to do this because of the expansive mind, which is when you tune into your mob, is, co is kind of that mind that's not very logical, right? And, um, and I'm thinking, you kind of sort of space out a little bit sometimes. And uh, I'm thinking, how am I going to do this? But it was amazing how, how, how quick thought is. You know how quick thought is? I was sitting in bed last night going through some past lives and just it comes so quickly. It just like, shh. And we have the ability to process so quickly. We, this thing that we're driving is like a supercomputer, you know, this mind, brain. And um, when you allow it, you can do all that stuff. It's only that, that those ideas of I can't that actually limit you and stop you from doing it. But when you just allow it, it happens so quickly. Thought just happens so quickly. You can process things a lot quicker than you can speak them. You know, it's even a lot quicker than you can actually see something. It's so interesting how it all works. So um, I could see it harder since you're getting intuition and hearing, you know, things and feeling thoughts and focusing on a guest that it would be very distracting to, you'd have to turn that off to go read a chat and then come back and it would take you out of that place. So I, I could see that that would not work for your style for sure. Um, this is probably better to stay like this. Where well, you can really feel your intuition. You've inspired what we're doing right now because I thought I would um, just quickly invite a couple of people on my, who are in my inner sanctum. Kristen's one of them who come on the monthly webinars that we have. I just invite those people to come on and, and meet you while I'm recording this for the show and you invited uni. So the fact that we've got this little group happening was inspired by your show. Mm -hmm. ah. awesome. Well, I appreciate it. I, I'm looking forward to meeting uh, Kristen and Uni, Uni and me are buddies. We, we cover, we're always on each other's show at this point. So <laughs> we're, we're yeah. kind of like show married. You know so. it. <laughs> hey, so, Uni, your mic, your mic's making a bunch of noise, dude. Oh. I can mute him. I've just nah, muted he's, him. He's just got to take it off his shirt. He's moving yeah. around too much. Um, right. you can well, I want to hear, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, you can unmute. I've muted you, Uni. You can unmute yourself if you want to have a if you want to say something. Um, but we were talking about the Mandela effect. So, have you got any questions for Taryn, Kristen, about the Mandela effect? Actually, I do because just the other day, something came up in my feed on Facebook or something, and it was all about. And I wonder if this might be a Mandela effect or if it's too old. The whole Paul is dead. You know what I'm talking about? Paul McCartney from the Beatles. There was this whole conspiracy. And I remember watching a documentary on it in the 80s, early 80s. 
um, you know, documentaries were few and far between back then, but there was one where there is this whole line that Paul died and they replaced him. Oh, and yeah. he looks a little different, but I don't know if it's age or I don't know. So as I have read about or heard about the Mandela effect, I almost wonder if this could be one of those, but I, I, I'm surprised you guys haven't ever heard of the whole Paul is dead. I, you know, there's a lot of weird Beatles stuff. Um, yeah. There's uh, Beatles albums that no one's ever seen that all of a sudden are, exist in this reality. There's, um, I, I feel like I remember hearing Paul died, but I don't, I don't have any personal experience with that. There is someone that there's this blog that's been around for a long time that someone swears they have a Beatles album where uh, nobody died that in another reality, the Beatles are still alive and playing and they brought back a cassette from another reality. They have it, but uh, again, that's all hearsay. I don't know. Uh, Uni, you know more about this one? I'm not, I'm not hip on Paul is dead. You know, I've heard about it. Uh, we, thought about talking about it a couple times. I wanted to collect more information on it. Um, you know, it is interesting though. We have, there's actually a lot of reports that people have about the Beatles. It's one, of, it's really popular in the uh, Mandela community. A lot of videos are made on it, but specifically um, I don't have anything yeah. else on I'll, it. I'll there. find out more for you on the show. I'll ask Thursday. Uh, well, not this Thursday, but then the following Thursday. Okay. If you want to swing by my show, Our, uh, there's a guy that we know named Moneybags that, that whenever I know him to, to find research about the Mandela effect, I throw it in his lap. Um, most of my sh stuff is kind of community building and how to deal with the shock. Uh, there's a huge, you know, this, this people stumble into this who are not spiritual. Um, well, they don't know it. They haven't unlocked it yet, or they don't, uh, they don't call themselves. They don't, they don't run in the world you guys run in. So when this hits them, they are really screwed up. I mean, it's like, you know, seeing Jesus come down or something, it's or, or finding aliens exist, it really messes their world up. And my community is more supporting those people that are like new and traumatized and, and trying to, figure, you know, let them know that they're not alone, they're not crazy. Because, and this is no joke, I say this and I'm absolutely serious. Um, it, it keeps people from getting institutionalized. We had some people show up in our chat that was like, I told people about this and because I um they were with you know uh, I, I think he was like 18 or something his parents stuck him in uh, a uh, mental ward to and they drugged him up and oh, it was no. the exact same stuff that we talk about every night in there mm -hmm. they said he was crazy and he you know of course the psychologists don't believe him and if he had found our chat room first he wouldn't have gone down that route you know, um, uh, so I, I do believe that in my sense, it's kind of like important that I keep this, this lifeline out or, uh, or, you know, some people are going to get unnecessarily medicated and uh, locked away. And I know that's sad, but I think that's the truth. So, yeah. So when I hear things or read things about the Mandela effect, um, I've read some books, um, by Dolores Cannon. Are you guys familiar with her work at all? Mm -hmm. and yeah, just talking about it. Yeah, and she talks a lot about, and maybe you did talk about this, sorry, but um, no, it looks okay. like you're looking up at me like Brady I, I Bunch. Am, it's very Brady Bunch style. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually, sorry. I'm talking to a few people that have also dropped in on this. There's a few people here. <laughs> okay, so, but my thing with Dolores <laughs> Cannon is she talks about how um, some people like walk out of their door in the morning and the world looks different than it did the day before. Um, then they go back inside because they forgot their keys or they're in shock and they come back out and it's normal again. And it happens to enough people that, yeah, I believe this Mandela effect really must be something. Well, that's, that's what it is, is I, I didn't want to believe it. Um, and, you know, you hear something in for the first few examples, you can dismiss it away. Like, oh, I have bad right. memory. I have this and that. But then like after 10 examples, you, you start running out of excuses. And after 20 things, changes show up. And now we're up to like 200 changes. You know, how do you explain away 200 changes that, uh, that so many people believe? If it was just you who was the only person being affected, yeah, you'd wind up in the loony bin. But the reason I feel good is because there's thousands of people going, yep, I have the same memory. 
as crazy as it sounds. So because this is happening on a massive scale, uh, it adds a lot to the legitimacy. And in, it's kind of like a bundle of sticks. If you have five or ten sticks, it's easy to break, but try breaking 200. You know, you can't, I've can't got a do chirping. it. So, yeah. uh, uh, I've got oh, a your people. mob, go yeah. ahead. Your mob's uh, cutting in. So I asked the Lawrence <laughs> to join us. And, um, really? Yeah. And oh, oh, awesome. I'm a fan of hers. Um, I've Me chatted too. with Dolores before. She's actually not here with the, the moment. I don't know why, but I tell you who is mm. here. Albert is here. Albert is Garnet Shawhouse's guide. And, um, hi, he, Albert. He, he wants me to tell you, uh, Taryn, to check out Garnet's books and to get Garnet on your show too. Who? Garnet? Garnet okay, Garnet Schulhauser, Kristen knows Garnet, is a guy that contacted me about a year and a half ago, I think, and asked me oh, to yeah. put me on his show, uh, uh, asked me to put him on, on my show. And he just told me a little bit of his story and I'm like, oh, wow, yeah, I want to talk to you. So he is a conservative Catholic corporate lawyer for like 30 years. He, he lives in Canada He's walking down the street one day and he is stopped by a homeless man who stares into his eyes, this love and light. And he has this beautiful blue eyes, you know, this, this gorgeous blue eyes. And, and uh, he's just mesmerized. He says he's like a deer in the headlight. And the homeless man says to him, why are you here? And then disappears. Long story short, turns out that this is his spirit guide called Albert who has woken him up to his soul plan, to his why he's here on the planet. Like he let him, like he's in his late 50s at this point, right? So he, he had this really third dimensional conservative life for 56 years and then he gets woken up and, um, and that he had a contract or a plan with Albert and his spiritual mob to awaken humanity through his books and um, Albert told him a whole lot of stuff which he wrote down in the first book and then in the second the book, the third book and the fourth book, he's taken him out of his physical body and flown him around the universe and shown him, you can't imagine, just like, oh my God. As a curious person, you know, a spiritual seeker, I've had a lot of questions about things on earth and these books have answered so many of those questions. Like he's spoken to different alien planets. But the thing that, the thing that why he chirped in was we were talking parallel realities. In Garnet's fourth book, which is not out yet, but he actually sent it to me to do a review, he visits another parallel reality of Earth. And it's quite controversial because what happened was because a few things didn't happen in that reality there's quite a different future so he goes to new york in our day and time so it's it's like 2017 and he's in a parallel reality in new york he's in his astral form so no one's can see him and he's looking around and seeing and it's quite different and i won't give it away you have to read the books but um it really speaks to what you're talking about with this like Dolores can like, you know, bleed throughs into different realities and parallel realities. And he also goes to another um, replica of earth in a higher dimension. And, and that's in, I think the third, first or second book, isn't it, Kristen? Anyway. And I think it's in the second, second book. And you, you've had this guy on your show. I've had him three to, for several times. I love God. He's my, like, he's my favorite. Sure, I just man. Hook, hook me up. If you I'll tell me up. I need to have him, I'll listen. Yeah. <laughs> so, I would love to hear his stories. That sounds cool. Yeah. Um, he, he doesn't actually channel Albert. Like uh, you can't sit and ask him to talk to Albert like you can to me because Albert basically contacts Garnet when he wants Garnet to learn something or to write something. So it's not, mm. well, when I say it's not at his will, I guess it could be, but at the moment it's not. So he doesn't, you know, chant like you can't talk to his mob like you can talk to my mob. You probably could, but that's not what he does at this point because he puts all his information in his books. Maybe later on he'll do that because I asked him one day if we could do that, we could get Albert on the show. And he goes, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So, so I I saw Garnet speak at a conference, and um, he I had gone to this conference with a girlfriend of mine, and her daughter is an incredible 
psychic intuitive working on her skills, but she's young. And she said the whole time we were sitting there listening to Garnet speak, she said, Albert's standing right over there the whole time. But, you know, I couldn't see him because I'm not there yet. But, you know, so he's there. What I think is so unique about Garnet's experience is that, like you say, he, he can't channel Albert when he wants. It's so much, it's just a much more different experience than anybody else I've read or studied or heard about their experiences. I, he's just very unique. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Look, years ago, I read a book by uh, Peter Richelieu called uh, A Journey, The Soul's Journey or something like that, and, um, or A Journey of Souls. There's a couple of books with the similar t- title. And it was a similar experience where um, this guy was actually at the end of the Second World War. He was living in India and his brother is shot down as a fighter pilot in the Second World War. And he gets this telegram and he's grieving because he's just got the news that his, his younger brother has died in the war. And then he's, he's a wealthy man living in India in a big mansion, as they did in those days, English man. And the butler answers the door and says, there's someone here to see you. He wants to talk to you about your brother. And he's literally holding the telegram with the news that his brother's dead. And he's like, what? And he lets this mm-hmm. turban man into his office, into his library, and the guy says, I'm here to talk to you about your brother. I, I want to take you to meet him. And he's like holding the telegram saying, I've just been told he's dead. And he goes, yes, I know. I'm going to come back tonight and I'm going to take you to meet him. And, and this guy's like, what? Are you crazy? Anyway, so the turban man goes away and he comes back at night when he's fallen asleep and he takes him out of, you know, his astral form. And he says, right, we're going to go meet your brother. And he goes and plays with different um, a, a bit like Albert, he goes to different levels of the astral and different dimensions and he meets his brother and he talks about his death and then how are you now and what are you doing with your life? And then he takes into a few different other dimensions. And I read that book when I was in my early 30s and I remember thinking, oh my God, this is amazing. Because it was written, I think it was written in the 40s or 50s or something. You know, it was written oh, a long time. It's and that old? Wow. Yeah, and then uh, and then Garnet contacts me, and he's doing the same thing, and I'm like, Hallelujah! <laughs> you know, because <laughs> it's really a unique experience, as you say, Kristen. That he, what happens is we're all doing what uh, uh, what Garnet and Peter Richelieu were doing. Right? We're all exploring different dimensions and different you know, places just, you know, in the universe when we're asleep at night because our souls are explorers, right? We're living our lives simultaneously, but we come back into our physical body and wake up in the morning inside the amnesia. You know, that's the way the rules are set up in this particular game and we don't remember. And the difference between them and us is they have this, uh, they're telling me not full memory, but they have, memory available to what they've done at night they have this doorway and so they come back with full memory and then write it all down and um and that's the difference between them and what's happening someone (laughs) yelling in the background okay (laughs) (laughs) that was that was your mob (laughs) Moms do okay. that. <laughs> yeah, it's really um, awesome that you said that about doorways. We did a conspiracy that was lo- uh, linked to when uh, there was a study, and when people walk through physical doorways, there was a study done to see if it affects their memory because a lot of people reported that when they went through the a doorway into another room, they would forget something. Yeah. And um, you know, you know, the feeling you get, you're like wait, I came in this room for a reason. Well, I don't remember. Yeah. So they did lots of studies around this and they, they found out a lot of really cool stuff that basically confirmed that when you enter a new room, it does have kind of an effect on you a little bit. And um, I'll have to, you know, get on my video and um, take some notes on it and look at it again because it really blinked. My, my mind kind of came straight to that when you said that. So yeah, it's really cool. Well, I went to a psychic years ago who, um, when I was, again, on, in my early 30s and I was on this intense, or maybe late 30s at this stage, uh, journey for, you know, meaning. And she told me something. I said, you know, how do you do what you do? Because I was exploring all this stuff. And she said, oh, it's really easy. You just visualize this doorway. 
and you know this light doorway and then you just walk up to it like you just use your visual and you step through it and you step through and to the other side and then you're on the other side and then you can go wherever you like and she just gave me that visual of the doorway uh, yeah so stepping through and 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 then years ago I did a past life regression and it was an amazing I've only ever had one past life regression and I and I blew it because I saw something that freaked me out and I and I stopped it and that's another story but she took me down stairways and then along a hall with all these doors right and um, this was like this guided meditation that she took me on took me deep 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 down and then I'm walking up, and then she said now pick a door and open it and then tell me what you see and I remember I did that and I saw something that freaked me out so I said oh I want to come back so I tried to pull myself back to this reality and I opened my eyes I'm sitting in a room with this woman on a chair staring at her I couldn't see anything everything was blank I had my eyes open and I was blind like I could not see through my physical eyes and I'm saying I can't see anything. I'm panicking. I can't see anything. I can't see anything. And she said, stop, 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 stop. You know, shut your eyes, shut your eyes. I've got to bring you back. You just can't come back. And so she had to bring me back out, you know, back to, back to here, back to now, so that my physical eyes would work because my physical eyes weren't working. So it was really interesting. The doorway thing is so interesting to, to move into a different reality. Yeah. Well, Karen, when you work with people, um, like I feel like I don't have a past life. Every person that's ever tried to regress me doesn't find anything. I feel like this is my first time here. Um, do you ever come across people like that? Oh yeah. There's a lot of people that are here for the first time, especially now, especially now. So what, what's happening is because we're moving uh, to a new exploration of reality and we're, we stop exploring violence, you know, uh, there are people that have incarnated and someone had said, you know, half the population of the planet, they're called star seeds. I don't know if it's half, but it's a lot. And um, they have specifically come into a physical body and incarnated into this dimension, onto this planet to help the evolution of consciousness. And they have been exploring different dimensions where you know, higher dimensions, they're not better or worse. They're not higher or lower, but just different realities. We call them ET or alien realities where the exploration of violence is not a part of the game. Do you know what I mean? So they have, they've experienced connectivity. They, they understand themselves as one. They understand the oneness of being that we're all trying to move to, towards. Because when you understand that you're one with another, then you stop trying to hurt that other person because you just hurt yourself. So they understand the oneness of being, that we're a collective, that we're not single, you know, individual humans. We're all connected. And they've specifically incarnated to help us, you know, break free of this ego mind that says, you're separate to me and what I do to you has no impact on me. You know, I can kill you. I can hurt you. I can rip you off. And it doesn't have an impact on me because that's actually not the truth of our being. Um, but that's what we believe. So they... And they're, and they're called star seeds, you know, many different names. They're called indigo, crystal, you know, they're just, we give people names, but <laughs> they're souls that are here that, that hold a different frequency, they hold a different consciousness. And some of them have been labeled autistic or Asperger's, you know, they're, a, they're, they're here with a different consciousness and, um, and it's their first life as a human. Mm. That's and um, I think Uni, you were saying the same thing too, right? That you and they're felt, telling me that you're yeah. not. You've li you've been here before. I have. Mm -hmm. Well, then I don't remember it because <laughs> I can't seem to get here. I I don't know. I uh, I always felt like I was. I, I you know I want to because everybody has all these cool like past life stories and I'm like no nah, man. They're, they're telling me that you've not explored this dimension too much. Uh, so you're not someone that's reincarnated over and over again. But what they're uh, telling me about you is that you came to dip your toe in the water, right? And um, so I'm like seeing one, sort of like one phys human past life. But you've, oh, okay. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. Okay, <laughs> something good. I hope. Oh, jeez, it's been censored. <laughs> What's up? Okay, That's so right. I, asked, I asked if you'd been an animal before because a lot of people take on an animal form. It's easier because there's not as much um, 
you know, crap that you have to deal with when you're an animal. It's easier. And they're saying, no, that you didn't, that you, that you went straight into human form. And, uh, but you did before this life, when I say before, it's happening simultaneously, but you have, you are experiencing another life as a human. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. But not well, a lot. It's not like, I, I've had so many yeah. past lives I can't count. Like I'm sitting in bed and they're I just showing me. I was, I was a couple of, I was a woman. I can't even remember what it was the other night. I was just sitting in bed and they were just showing me all this stuff and I'm going, oh, that's interesting. Oh, oh. And it was explaining why I felt, I was asking them questions about me. It was explaining why I had specific feelings about different things and they're showing me a life that I'm leading doing this and doing that. And I'm going, Oh, that makes sense. Oh, that's why I feel like that. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And I, but um, I can't really remember it, but anyway. Mm. Well, I, I was saying this because I think me and Uni talked about it once and he was like, yeah, I don't really feel like I've had past lives either. Right. Yeah. Uni, definitely. You never regressed. I, I, I wonder if so. that's more common these days. Like she's saying mm. that there's, there's going to be groups Very of common. us that. You know, what's strange is when she said that about animals, I've had dreams and you know, Flat, like feelings sometimes that come through and I feel like I'm well, like I used to walk on I know this sounds crazy no you I, I used to animal. walk on all fours you know what yeah, I'm yeah, you I feel like animal. I have mm -hmm. like when I run through the woods sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like I want to kind of just jump down and act like a kitty cat or something mm -hmm. so. <laughs> I get along with cats really well I really do <laughs> yeah no you you definitely uh you definitely explore the animal kingdom mm-hmm definitely mm-hmm I get that feeling. I really do. That's so cute. I want to be a cat. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing about, you know, we're all souls. Even trees are a soul or an aspect of our soul. Like we're, because we're multidimensional, we're exploring, we're exploring different, you know, different forms, different consciousness, different planets, different dimensions. We're exploring all of it. You know, why, why wouldn't you? You're a soul who has it all available and then we have to pick and choose. It's like a smorgasbord of adventure. And uh, being a tree or being a rock or being an animal or being an alien in another planet, you know, there's just so much to explore. And I really, um, this really was brought home when I, when I read Garnet's books. Like his adventures are so expansive, yeah, Kristen? that it really makes you um, realize that, wow, there's just so much going on, you know. Mm. He, this could be a weird side note, but how do you get invited to speak at conferences and stuff? Like you're talking about how Garnet and you and you guys go to speak at these. What, I've never been to any conference like this. What, how do you... How do you Kristen, find these things Kristen and where do you that. go? She, she actually helps Kristen. On. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm, oh, well, I'm starting. I'm starting to help. Um, so when I saw Garnet speak, it was because the publisher of his book put on a conference oh. um, and they do one every year. Uh, but um, they had not everybody that spoke was one of their writers, but that's was Garnet. And so, um, and this is in yeah, California I just find or? it's people who no. Um, I live in Utah and it was in Arkansas oh. um, through Ozark Mountain Publishing. I don't but, know which, them. which is Dolores Cannon. I just find that I oh I've yeah. seen them before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he he's on. Excuse me with the microphone. He's on Dolores Cannon's um, publishing company. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just found that I really like going to these things. But now that I'm starting to get behind the scenes on them, um, it's more of somebody knows somebody who spoke at this, or they saw them here. Uh, you know, and some, sometimes it's, it's, you know, we don't have a lot of money to pay you. Can you come? Um, Garnet, I get the sense that he looks for people to be on their show. Like Karen, didn't, Karen, didn't you say he asked to be on your show? Mm -hmm. Because I think he feels his message. Um, I mean, that's his job now is to mm -hmm. get his message out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I have no idea if there's fees involved, but I just know that I'll, I look for his new videos on YouTube. I subscribe. Um, but uh, <laughs> he, most people say, oh, and Garnet contacted me. So, mm -hmm. but he doesn't, but he doesn't speak at conferences that often that I found. I don't, I don't know why, but mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I'm just curious because, you know, I, I was telling her I was new to this world, so I've never been to like a conference. I don't even know where they are, what they are, but it, is interesting that cause does, is that still a thing um physical conferences now that you can do just mm -hmm. like online conferences and meetings mm -hmm. and 
people still go to those? They're, 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 I don't know if I just notice them more or they're just getting more common. But um, if I put one together and I have the Mandela effect, I'll definitely invite you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, man. Pass <laughs> me out around if someone's interested in that topic. So somebody, I'd love to go somewhere. That'd be fun. Somebody contacted me yesterday who wants me to speak to Roberta Grimes. Do you know who she is, Kristen? So Roberta Grimes is a past, you know, an afterlife researcher and she is a, I think she's a corporate lawyer. No, hang on. What is she? She's some sort of lawyer or something. And um, anyway, fascinating lady. And she's a good friend of Sandra Champlain, who is a friend of mine who has a show called We Don't Die. I've been on her show. She's been on my show. And the two of them are involved in a afterlife research and education symposium, which is happening in September in Scottsdale, Arizona. So I don't know how far that is away from you guys. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I'm actually <laughs> set to go. I'm going. Are you? I'm yep. going as a guest. I mean, just to visit. Yes. Mm. So it's a long way I, from you, Taryn. I got friends out there, though, but that yeah. would be fun. I, I just refuse to fly anymore, so I have to drive everywhere. I'm, I'm like, Why don't I you like flying? flying? Oh, that's a whole nother. I hate the TSA. Whole... the TSA. The TSA, the, it's such, it's so insulting. The the whole process just to fly now is, is, uh, uh, I, I just refuse to support it anymore. Oh, I love it's super guy. inconvenient to drive everywhere, but mm, you okay. know I can plan it it's out. Fun, it's still fun. I just, drive. I, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean, it's like the Arizona is like two days at least, three. You know, it's like I, I love I, a good road trip. Spend the night oh, in Salt Lake City <laughs> with me. There you go. <laughs> um, Come stay with my family in this awesome house, right? <laughs> right that is a cool house, man. I'm straight <laughs> up. I'm I love that ceiling. <laughs> Uh, and we come, come. We've got uh, down here. We've got uh, Catherine and Mick put on the Afterlife Explorers, the Close Encounters, and now they're putting on this year, or is it next year? This year, the Cosmic Consciousness uh, Conference in Uluru. So there are a few things you, you guys will have to come out for those one year. They're full steam ahead with those conferences. There's all sorts of things. There's millions and millions and millions of conferences. Yeah, I just I'm so new to this world. I didn't know any of this existed. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. There you go. So we, we, might wrap up. we might we might wrap it up. It's uh, getting to half past the hour. We've been on here for about two hours now. This is the longest show oh. I've done. <laughs> oh really? I thought that I didn't know how long your show. Was. Okay. <laughs> well, on YouTube it doesn't matter because I used to have it on radio and I used to have to cut it up into sections and play music in no. between. I don't do that anymore. So freedom, I can chat for so much. Oh, so much editing. Uh, it's the worst. Just just roll with it now, man. Uh, free yourself from editing. Free yourself from editing. And, and, you, know, you can't do it, can you? Depends on my <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't. Depends Too much of a perfectionist. You can't let it go. <laughs> depends on my schedule, too. If I've got clients booked in or other things booked in but this morning, it's all sweet. So we could go longer. But thank you, everyone, for joining. No more thank questions. You. Thank you. That was fun, man. Thanks. It was. It was good interview. Let me know if you find out anything about the Paul is dead Mandela effect. We'll get on that. Yeah, come <laughs> come see my show tomorrow night. Come on I will. by the live show. Yeah, I will. It'll be groovy. On well, YouTube that, or where? Yeah, actually, that's going to be a weird show. That's not actually a, that Mandela. It's going to be on psychedelic drugs and uh, and spirituality. So that one's a little different than my normal shows, but I've, I've got some that sounds exciting guests. It, yeah, it's, it's a cool, it's definitely going to be a very cool topic. Uh, but it's not really Mandela effect stuff that much besides okay. shifting realities. Uh, but I get so many questions about psychedelic drugs and I don't use them. So like I brought an expert in that this guy's a trip that, so it, it should be a hell of a, a heck of an interview. Who's your expert? <laughs> a guy named Perry. Uh, there's a guy named Barry Cooper here who, uh, well, he's not here. He's in Peru now, but um, he was an ex police officer. Uh, he was a police officer that used to arrest people for drug use, and he had a uh -huh. crisis of conscience where he felt like he was hurting people and doing bad things, uh, fighting against the drug war. So he jumped sides, and he quit being a cop, and he put out videos called Never Get Busted that taught people how not to get arrested by police. And, um, and then the police got so mad about it, they ran him out of the country, basically. And now he does uh, ayahuasca tours down in Peru, and and uh i will gain for people that have addiction problems so i'm very interested in uh you know there's such a long history of psychedelic drugs and spirituality of you know shamans using them and people using it fasting and taking these things and uh so we're gonna talk about it i mean i'm not scared to talk about it at least so we're doing it 
<laughs> That's right. That sounds live. There's, a, live. There's, a, there's a documentary that just came out that uh, Unify put out, actually. You know Unify on uh, Facebook? Unify is a huge movement. They've got about oh, a million followers. Anyway, and this guy. I'm so out of the loop. <laughs> You're like, do you know this guy? Do you know that? I'm like, no, I'm sorry. I'm out of the loop. <laughs> this guy, um, he found in the Bible that there was a verse that said that they took some, um, they had some terminology for it. And he started asking all these uh, biblical scholars and, and priests, you know, do you know what this means? This, uh, this thing in the Bible. And basically it's talking about, there's some images, biblical images of mushrooms behind people. They were taking psychedelic mushrooms to have some spiritual hmm. And they talk about it in the Bible. So it's really interesting. I'll, I'll send you the um, documentary. But we must go. Thanks for joining us, Uni. Thanks for your... Thank you. I appreciate hey, it. They're always there. <laughs> yeah, Uni has a channel too. Go visit his channel. Yeah, I will. On YouTube. <laughs> Check me out. I appreciate yeah. you. And thanks, everyone, for joining me for another show. I hope you stayed all the way to the end. And remember, if you want to, I'm going to be teaching in a couple of weeks how to tune into your guides, your spirit guides, talk to your mob, because everybody's got a mob, let me tell you. We've all, and I like to make this really mainstream and really easy and really normal. You don't have to be some supreme guru or channel or someone that flies around the universe like Garnet and writes books. You don't have to be any of that to talk to your mob they're knocking themselves out to talk to you let me tell you your dead friends your dead relatives your dead loved ones your spirit guides your guardian angel they are knocking your themselves out to get your attention because when you have this communication with them that's the best life guidance you can have you know you don't need to go you don't need to watch a million youtube anymore that's just all fascination you can just have that own conversation with your mob and that they, they know you more intimately than you know yourself so uh, they have this broader perspective they can see all your lives happening simultaneously so join me just go to my uh I'll put a link under this YouTube for that and um, check out my website, karenswain.com. And uh, Doc, do you have a website you want people to check out or just your channel? Uh, just go to my YouTube channel, but I, I do have a website, but it, there's not that much on it. So yeah, YouTube channel. Come to uh, just Google Taryn Lupo. It's really simple. I'm all over the place on YouTube. I'll put a link under this. Thanks, oh, everyone. Nice. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Bye. And if you want to meet some more of my guests and be a part of uh, the show and the Inner Sanctum, join us in the Inner Sanctum. Bye for now. Thanks so much for joining us for another enlightened conversation on Accentuate the Positive. If you would like spiritual guidance from my guides, Blissful Beings, go to karenswain.com for a reading or to listen to more enlightened thought leaders, share their wisdom. Go to the listen page on karenswain.com and choose who you want to listen to. All the podcasts are also available on iTunes. Remember to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, you name it, we're there. Until next time, bye for now. If you feel like that's what you want to do.